let me just jump in here. Um, first of all, because I've sat there for a long time, <laughs> See <you>. playing, <laughs> playing extremely bad chess. Um, you beat me. <laughs> and secondly, because I still don't understand what we're actually talking about. Ah. Um, when I say je suis européen, then I mean really, if I'm honest, a feeling. I feel at home under a European sky, I feel at home with the landscapes, with the reflexes of the people, with the turns of phrase. I also feel at home with European values. Mm. And as a philosopher, no, I cannot give you an ultimate metaphysical nail to which I could nail them, but I feel at home with them. Now, that is one part of the conversation. If we talk about the European Union and debt repayments, then I am, <laughs> first of all, I think much more pragmatic, because I think without a European Union, we would probably not be able to solve or e indeed face any of the problems that come our way in terms of climate change, international money markets, migration movements. They're all, they're all transnational, move the transnational problems. No nation state can deal with them. So we need this kind of thing. But you say there really is a European spirit. And you know, that is because you're talking about an elite. There is no real European spirit among all Europeans because this European Union is in a terrible crisis of political legitimacy. Yeah. It has none. It has not worked for it. It has been too elitist. Look at this ridiculous moment with the European Constitution when basically a former French president was asked to draw up a nice constitution which was almost 200 pages long and very complex. And then people were given the choice between saying yes or being bad Europeans. <laughs> and um, if you voted wrong, you had to vote again yes. until you voted yeah. right. And that's not how any democracy works. We could have voted a constitutional assembly and let them get on with it and draw up a constitution. That would have been our constitution. That would have been rem remotely democratic. So. I think we are really talking about two completely different things. Because when I go back to the first part, the feeling European part, then I'm not at all sure whether Norwegians and Greeks and Portuguese and Poles feel the same. In their practices, in their daily life, in their beliefs, how much really does connect us? I think that's an open question. Yes, we have a history of wars. Yes, we have a history of Christianity. Yes, we all inhabit the same small appendix of Asia. But does that mean that we really have a common identity? You know, here would be a nice task for the European Union, namely to foster such an identity, but at the moment but it's I failed think, spectacularly. I think you are very right, but I think there's one moment when we can all um, unambiguously feel that European identity, and that's when we're outside of Europe. Yeah. When I lived in the Middle East, I realized I was a European. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to Europe five years later, I actually wasn't so sure. <laughs> it's easier to feel European in Jerusalem or in Tokyo than in Rome or even Berlin these days. I think it's the only place where you can feel European outside Europe. The, the, the reason why I participate in this debate <laughs> is first of all because there's no such a thing as European nationalism. I think nothing good can come out of nationalism, and I despise anti-European feelings a bit more than the European feelings. But when you ask me why are you European, that's my, my answer would be because I moved a few years ago to New York. <laughs> and what else can See? I be in New York but European? <laughs> I have no other choice, and I'm quite happy about it. I'm not sure, so, um, I, I like many things Adam said because I love your provocations. I think they're really smart and, and, and <laughs> intelligent. In which you said something about the rearmament of Europe. Well, first of all, Arnau, of course, did rearm his country despite earlier promises. But I think what you really wanted to say is that the, the peace is not only kept by the European Union, Union, but also by the United States of America, if I understood you well. L let me finish for one yeah, second. The crucial so, point, yeah. And this is also why I think this whole question about feelings or whether we love Europe or not, it's all a bit gratuitous. In the end, at the, end the question is, are we willing to die for Europe? And if not, what does it mean to, uh, to have this feeling of being European or not? And to be honest, if you ask me, are you willing to die for Europe or are you willing to die for the United States of America without idealizing the US, without thinking that, that this is a better place, I would be tempted to say, I would rather die for the US than for Europe. 
because I think the continuation of Europe is in Canada and the US. I think if I were a member of a minority mm -hmm. in, in, Euro in Europe... I don't get I that. Would yeah. Th that you have okay. to explain uh, that, because I, will, I don't understand I think, what you're saying. Well, of course, the European culture <laughs> is American culture. You cannot separate it. And I think in, in many ways, the, the, the better place to live for many minorities... Fritz Bolkestein is in the audience, and I, I would disagree with him on many things he said. <laughs> but a few years ago in, in New York, he gave a talk, and he said an interesting and, and important thing. He said, people vote with their feet. So the fact that so many people, despite the criticism of the U.S., would like to go to the U.S. is telling. Yesterday, I talked to an Afghan asylum seeker. He said, I asked him, why did you come to the Netherlands? He said, because I could not find a human trafficker who would bring me to the U.S. I would have <laughs> rather gone to the U.S., <laughs> but I could not find one. So that's what yes. I mean. I think okay. in many ways, if I would be a Muslim <laughs> in Europe, I would want to go to, to, to Canada or the U.S. If I would be in Adam, I think this is the safer, the better place. And this is also why I think this I come back now and then you can finish to your comment. I think nobody, we all love Europe, but in the end, nobody is willing to die for Europe. Mm -hmm. There's a movie made uh, by Clint Eastwood that came out a couple of months ago, American Sniper, about a sniper fighting in Iraq. It's unthinkable that we would have a movie German Sniper, for historical reasons, even <laughs> Dutch. No, 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 there's no European yeah, Sniper. There's no <laughs> sniper. <laughs> we, had, we had the ISAF, ISAF in Afghanistan. According to American soldiers, I've been, as you know, a few times to, American, to uh, Afghanistan, ISAF stands for I Saw Americans Fighting. And this is basically what you were saying. We, de we have peace because Americans are willing to die for us and are willing to fight for us. And we are not willing to do it for, for good reasons. Um, dying is not, not a nice thing. But it is a bit problematic that we are talking about Europe without being willing to die for it. Yeah, now you can well, what's your perspective? Mm. Well, but, but I have to say that, that the one place where you really feel European is in the American Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You know, forget Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my view is, is a little complicated because I got, got into Europe via the United Kingdom and before the, the European Union was really uh, cre created properly. So I'm, I'm, I'm not at all surprised about the, the developments at the moment to see that country go back to itself because it's never left itself. So my job there was to... Uh, uh, import continental culture to the UK coming from uh, being born in the Middle East. So it's a very complicated route in there. So for me, being a European is a, is a strange notion. Uh, when I was uh, 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 12, I, I said to my parents, I don't believe uh, that Europe exists. You have to take me there. I want to see it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll never believe it exists. I'd never been. And then I was brought to the heart of Europe, to Munich. That was really the heart of, of Europe. And, uh, and, and my, my country is, is culture. So I, I came here because I, I had a cultural um, calling, a desire to uh, connect with European culture. But at that time, culture for me was uh, uh, represented by holy fathers, to use a Christian term. Mm. It was basically poets, artists, specific people. Uh, a lot of them were still alive. Uh, I was kind of really coming on a pilgrimage towards something very specific. It's very interesting because, of course, this discussion is very political now, but I, I think what is also another level of the discussion is the, the destruction of culture through the sheer um, uh, drive of modernism and how, in fact, you know, between the birth of Mozart and the death of Stockhausen, we have an era of culture which, which is, I would call, a culture of specifics. And after that, we are entering into an era where everything is now flat. Everything is dominated by a kind of digital uh, energy uh, which, which we are meant to all bow to. And, and uh, uh, I often try to kind of put myself, now that I have a small child and I'm who's born here and has to look back towards the East instead of me looking to the West, it gave me thoughts about how, what do I really want my child to, 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 uh, to what kind of cultural calling would I, I like my child to have taken my own journey. And I'm very, very concerned, extremely concerned, because I think that, you know, in the middle of this European discussion, there's also a discussion about the, the disintegration 
of, uh, of what I call the, the culture of specifics into something, into a morass of something very vague in which we are, we are meant to... Uh, uh, I, one of the concepts that changes completely is the concept of curiosity because, of course, an intellectual is a curious person. It's, it's a person who wants to find out something about something they don't know, then relate it to other levels of knowledge and create an interaction and a debate, like the one we're having now, and, you know, culture is born from there. And so this curiosity notion is changed. It's changed completely because, of course, our curiosity is on our computers now. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of boiled down to something, uh, to a completely different form of energy.